Hello, I'm Donna Carcacci Rose. I'm the Executive Director of the Doylestown Historical Society. Welcome to another exciting video in our ongoing video history series. Our mission at DHS is stated as preserving and celebrating the creative and historic significance of Doylestown and its neighboring communities. I thank each of you for your support in providing this program, our tours, our speakers, and our exhibitions. Jonathan McSurdy, our interviewer today, was originally introduced to DHS when the group was still meeting in the Barrow Building on West Court Street. He joined at his first meeting and has been associated with DHS ever since. Thank you for being part of this valuable and important work to keep history alive for us now and for our future. We are here with May Cryer of Rosie the Riveter, and we'd like to thank you for, for agreeing to do this. So we're going to talk about your service to your country. We're going to talk about kind of what you've done since then. Uh, but we'd like to start kind of where it all began, uh, which was in North Dakota. Can you tell us a little bit about your, your, uh, your childhood years? Well, it was in 1926. When I was born, it was the Great, we had the Great Depression. We had the Dust Bowl, mm -hmm. had the stock market crash. That was all in that decade. Mm -hmm. The only nice thing that came out of that decade is my mother got the right to vote. And I thought that was so amazing. That was uh, so important, but uh, mm -hmm. um, it took a long time for that. I love telling the stories how uh, we lived in a small town, and it was halfway between two small, two larger uh, towns, and we had what they called a coal port. The trains were run by coal and water. Where they mm -hmm. would stop in our town. And uh, they called them tobo hobos, but there were, some of them were important men traveling to find a job but during the Great Depression. They'd get off that uh, train, they'd come to the door. I can remember many times they'd knock on the door. My mother would, uh, they'd ask, of course, they offered to do a job, but they wanted something to eat. And my mother would make them an egg sandwich because we always had chickens. Mm -hmm. And I can remember them sitting on the step and they would eat their sandwich and they'd think they were very appreciative. They'd thank my mother and mm -hmm. they'd get back on the train. But they, the people didn't realize these weren't just bums. These were some of these were professional people looking for work, you know. In the East Coast or West Coast, there was industries so it was a little better. They had a little better chance of finding a job. But in the Middle West, it was just a matter of survival for all of us. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so you had mentioned that you know you you took care of each other. Oh, definitely. If if somebody was out of work, I remember many times when my folks would take somebody in for a while till they could get back on their feet. Uh, it, it was just a matter of housing and food, mostly food. But, uh, I mean, it just whatever we could do for each other, we did. Like I said, I'm proud to say that I was a member of the greatest generation because mm -hmm. we cared about each other. It was very important. Up until 1930, things were terrible. When uh, President Roosevelt started putting in these good programs, like mm -hmm. WPA and CCCs, which would the CCCs would take young boys and put they'd take them into camps and they'd do, do road work, clean, mm -hmm. uh, plant uh, tree claims, things like that. Well, that was a blessing to large families because that left, was one less they had to feed. And of course, the WPA, that was great because it put some of the men to work. And I can remember at that time, my father went to work with the WPA oh, for a while. Oh, well, yeah, because he was working for my uncle on a farm when I was small. And so and that was a blessing. And that's when things started to get better. As the 30s, we went into the 30s, of course, now Hitler was taking over Europe, and it was starting to become very scary. Now our lifestyle was, uh, was, was getting much better. It was fearful for the rest of the world. What, what kind of news were you getting about Hitler? Oh, I, I especially remember, you know, as a child, or you're young, I was young, I didn't pay a whole lot of t attention until I remember when Hitler went into Warsaw or Poland, uh, okay. how sad that was. Now, of course, that was, in, I think, in toward the late uh, 30s. But things you now were looking good for us. I mean, now my mother had a job, my father had a job. Mm -hmm. They had bought a car. I think they bought a new Plymouth for eight, $800. I can't begin to tell you how we felt about each other. I don't know whether it was just the Midwest, but I don't think so. I think it was the rest of the world, how we uh, took a look out for one mm -hmm. another. 
And so, so that's that that's something that's that's kind of changed a little bit since then. Oh, right, that yeah. way. Okay. Okay. <laughs> of course, don't forget we didn't have junk food. We didn't have what we could run to the store and buy. Mm -hmm. We, you had just everything that was absolutely necessary. We didn't. There's nothing. Mm -hmm. I think we had a cake once in a while. We were very fortunate. During this time. How did you entertain yourselves? There, there was no TV, right? Well, no, I was a tomboy, so I loved to climb trees and go out okay. and, uh, up, all along the prairie. Sometimes you'd find wildflowers, things like uh -huh. that. I can remember being very fascinated by a little flower, which was rare, you know, the, okay. with, like I said, with the Dust Bowl, you didn't find many pretty sure. things. You know, we played outside, too. We played all kinds of games. At, at, you know, we didn't have uh, videos or anything else. Um, you hear the kids talk today, I said they have no idea that our lifestyle was spent that with. And I think that's what helped keep us healthy and make us healthy and strong, sure. you know. Now you said your father was a storyteller. Oh God, he loved to tell stories. You know, we had nothing, so we sat around on that pop alley stove at night. Mm -hmm. And if we had an apple or something, they had what they called root cellars at that time, and they'd buy a crate of apples and they'd last all winter. Mm -hmm. And I can remember he'd get an apple out and he'd be peeling it and telling the stories and we'd be so excited. We were young and we couldn't wait for the next story or the next piece of apple. That was our treat. <laughs> you know? Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that mm -hmm. was a big treat for us. Mm -hmm. But no, he loved to tell stories and he always told stories about the moon and the stars and just great stories like that. And every time I get where I'm with astronauts or any of the space programs, all I could say is I wish my father could see what I've done. See you now. I, yeah, it's just, just, just amazing the people mm -hmm. that I've met and the mm -hmm. stories that I've heard. It's funny because I don't remember any sadness in my life. I guess it's because I came from such a, a good family, warm family. Mm -hmm. uh, and my mother and father were always civic-minded people. Kind of tell me about the early 40s before, kind of before Pearl Harbor. My mother had started working in a small cafe. And that helped bring in money. Now my father started working for a grain elevator. And so now that we had two incomes, which was great. Uh, so eventually my father became manager of the grain elevators. So that, uh, that gave us a good life. I was a teenager and I wasn't too, I was more interested in dancing or, you know, chasing the boys, stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so when did you hear about Pearl Harbor? It was a Sunday, and my sister and I had been to a matinee. And we came home, my, our parents were sitting by the radio very upset. And we said, what had happened? They said, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. And I stood there and I said, you know, I don't think I know where Pearl Harbor is. And you know, I, that was amazing because I thought that was because we weren't sophisticated about the rest of the world. But as I've traveled and been with a lot of these American uh, GIs from World War II, Many of them tell me they, the same thing. They didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. We knew our fleet. We knew we had a fleet, but mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing when I did get to Pearl Harbor for the 80th celebration and see, when you see what took place, it's so amazing, yeah. so amazing. That changed the, mm -hmm. the, our whole world. It's not just our country, but our world. So pretty quickly after that, you were recruited, or, or how did you wind up getting to Seattle? Oh, no, we weren't recruited at all. When the, the war broke out, as soon as the men could enlist, all of these young men, including my brother, enlisted immediately. Mm -hmm. And I said it was just took the heart right out of our town. And so then my uncle enlisted, too, and that's where my mother mm -hmm. became the real mail, mail carrier. But no, no, we were still in school. We still had a, a year of school. So when school was out in 1943, my sister and I and our girlfriend decided to go to Seattle. We thought, well, let's go to Seattle for the summer. It ought to be a lark. We'll have fun. But the way it turned out, we loved it, and we stayed all through the war. And we all three of us became Rosie the Riveters. So you wound up in Seattle, mm -hmm. um, and you were 17 years old. Right. <laughs> and, and you were going to start at the Boeing factory. Right. How much training did you get? Well, they, we took us downtown for two weeks. We had, they put a piece of uh, metal in a vice. And first they teach you how to be a bucker, or they teach you how to drill holes. You have to learn how to do it, use a drill pretty well. Mm -hmm. And then you learn how to, to rivet it itself. After two weeks' time, into the factory we went working on these huge bombers. Yeah. It was amazing because it usually tried to put you with somebody that would, uh, you know, help bring you along for a while, which was nice. But then after a while you got to be a, 
Well, after you survived the men, the men were harder on the the women when they first came in. Mm -hmm. uh, they always laugh when I tell them about them. They don't. When I started working with this one man from Ohio, God, he was he was good and funny, but he was also respectful. But he loved to play tricks on me, mm -hmm. and he sent me to a tool crib for something stupid. And then when I get there and ask for it, they just thought that was so funny. They laughed. Okay. One day he sent me for what, what was an important tool, and I wouldn't go because I thought he was pulling my leg, mm -hmm. you know, so, and I wouldn't go. Okay. And it was so funny because that was one we needed bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so at first you said you were a bucker. Right. Explain what that is. Yeah, well, you know, the riveter has the rivet gun and the rivets on the outside of the, I, mean, I worked in the wing, in the cell, that's where the engine is. Or goes and um, the, the river has the rivet and the rivet gun on the outside. You are on the inside with the bucking bar. Now, when that when she shoots that rivet in there, your bucking bar has got to be behind it to seal it. And so, this is uh, if you get a good riveter, it's not hard at all when you're inside that wing uh, because you just kind of pick up a rhythm. Or you have to be young and not claustrophobic to we be in there because okay. it's tight quarters, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. okay. And I said, I laugh, I look at it now, and I think I see B-17s, and I think, how did I ever get in there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. How long were you bucking for? Uh, not too long, because I became a riveter pretty, pretty fast. And like I said, I worked with this man from Ohio. Well, he was a, uh, a man riveter, usually worked on the bigger rivets, or he had a b bigger rivet gun than I had. But a lot of times he'd ask me to go with different places with him where they needed an experienced bucker. That was a good experience all the way around. So, so while you were in Seattle, you were you were there for a couple of years, right? right? Mm -hmm. And and um, you, how much were you? Uh, you were getting paid. Mm -hmm. how, how much were you getting paid? I think we started at ninety-two cents an hour. I think right, it was right there. Around, now that was a lot of money, you know, because we hadn't earned money before. Uh, I don't know, it was my first check of what I wanted to watch. I can remember buying myself a watch. Oh, I was so thrilled over that. Boy, I could okay. buy something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you had said that that you were doing, you were working as a a riveter, but th there was there was a reason. Oh, well, yeah, you know, when we started out, we went there, we thought we'd do it for the summer. We thought it'd be fun. We were more interested in making money. But you get caught up in that, what this is all about. And you become very patriotic, and you realize why you're doing it. it. Isn't for money now? It's to save our country. We were young kids, but there's the women like the Gold Star mothers, a mother who lost a son. She didn't quit working because she lost her son. She said, "I don't want another mother to lose her son because he doesn't have the equipment he needs." And we had so many widows that lost their husbands, and they hung right in there. They didn't quit because of a, a you know sad part of their life. They realize that this is what our country needs. And you know, every man, woman, and child dropped everything to do that. It wasn't my job or your job, it was our job. Everybody stepped up. Mm -hmm. How many planes do you think you made? Oh, God, I can't even imagine. No, my name is on the five grand. Uh -huh. Now, that was in 1944, and that was the 5,000th plane we made, a B-17, since Pearl Harbor. I know Boeing made 12,000 B-17s. I think we only made about 4,000 B-29s, but that's not all just in the Boeing plant where I worked. There was other uh, plants like in Wichita and Omaha. So then you said while you were out there, you met your husband where? On the dance floor. Okay, okay. okay. 1944, uh, we you know, met him on the dance floor at the Servicemen Center in Seattle. Boy, could he dance, he's a beautiful dancer. We danced our way through life. And, and it was nice because we just become real good friends. In 1945, we, he was transferred, and we decided we were more than just friends. We decided to get married. And we were married just eight days after Roosevelt died. So, so you were married out there, um, and the war wasn't over at this point. When did you stop doing the, the riveting? Well, I, it started when, the, of course, when I left Seattle then, when I, he was transferred to a naval air station in Pasco, Washington. So now I left Boeing and went to work for the Army Engineers. And now we were uh, making uh, products to go, uh, like a transformer. The engineers were sending a lot of equipment overseas now for reconstruction. And uh, we, there was a prisoner of war, Italian prisoner of war on the compound. And I used to come in and work with this. And I've talked about that so often. That was such a fascinating time in my life because of, some of them could speak English pretty well. But I look back on it and I think, 
you know, they were just uh, people that wanted to go home on this world and go home to their families just like we did. You know, I think they gave me 80 cents a day uh, for like um, cigarettes or cos the ones I'd work with us. When the war was, it was funny because my husband had um, gotten to leave now. The, we had, um, uh, you know, the, we were pretty sure we had the Germans on the run and, and the, it looked like it was dying down in the uh, Pacific too now. And my husband had a leave, and we came home east. Now that's when I met his family, and I said I was, you know, I'd never seen the Atlantic. I'd never seen the ocean before, and the Atlantic, New York. We just had a really, really nice uh, time. And on our way going back to uh, uh, Washington, and that the war was declared over when we were on the train. Well, people were eating all these trains, you know, because we had to stop. Uh, people were meeting the trains and there were pot, pots and pans. Every, just everybody was celebrating. It was a, uh, the train now was probably 90% military. And by the time now, people, I don't know where they were getting the booze, but the, I don't know the people were giving it where they were able to get it on the train. Okay. But by the time we got back to Washington, that was an over, you know, at least an overnight trip. We had some sick pups on that train. <laughs> <laughs> but they were so happy because now they didn't have to, they knew they were probably on their way back to the Pacific or, right. you know, so. Uh, that's the way we remember World War II being over. So we still had time back in, in Pasco in, in, before, you know. It takes a long time to process them. My husband had enough points to get out, uh, but he had to, uh, when he did get home, I think it was like October, November by the time we got home here. Mm -hmm. That was August. And he went to Wildwood, and then they sent him to Bainbridge, Maryland. I think that was where he was finally, uh, uh, you know, got his uh, discharge from. But oh, then, okay. then it was hard times after that, after the war was over, because everybody was retooling. Mm -hmm. and they're going back to making household items now. And General Electric, General Motors, Westinghouse, they all had union problems. And so we, mm -hmm. there were strikes, one strike after another. And that was, it was, it was difficult right after World War II. So after World War II, after you got got done, you came back to, to this area, and it was Westinghouse, correct, is where you're... Well, he, yeah, okay. he worked at Westinghouse when he got out of school. And so the, this is then the, is this the the, the late 40s? Yeah, yeah, yes. 19, okay. If, yeah. You said you started a family, correct? Yeah, well, we were home in 1945. Okay. And uh, uh, we, uh, there was a house down the street that they were going to rent. His family said they'd rent it, rent it for us. By the time we got home, they changed their mind. They wanted to sell it. So we decided to buy it, and it was $3,750. Can you imagine that? And, and what was the interest rate, do you remember? Yes, 4%. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so then you started a family. You had some, some, I guess, children at that point in time. Right. I had my, my daughter. In fact, I was expecting her by the time we got home. Uh, she was born in 46, mm -hmm. and my son was two years later. And then there were so many strikes and all during the Korean War. I went back to work for a while. And w where did you go to work at? That was down in Bristol. They had a, I don't know, it was called Kaiser's. I believe it was called Kaiser's or Fleet Wing in Bristol, Pennsylvania. But they had a, a regular plant there during the war. Mm -hmm. and, and you were once again riveting, drilling, and... Okay. Yeah, right. And I didn't work too long because I had small children. It was very okay. difficult, you know but enough to get our, get our head above water where sure. it was from all the strikes. I started working down at the steel mill for a, a New York van, a Vanguard construction. Mm -hmm. uh, for five years, I worked for them. When they were leaving, they were building the blast furnace and all the, the steel mill, uh, big, big things on the steel mill. And as they were leaving the area, the electricians on the job asked me, would I come to work for them? So I went to work for Piper Electric. And I worked for them for about 18 and a half years. And then they were going down, down the, the tube. And I went to work for Scott Electric for another 10 or 11 years. So actually I worked for 30 some years. But I worked out through the union. I didn't work for the union, but I, I, I got the union benefits with mm -hmm. Local 269 in Trenton. So kind of after your working career and your, your kids had grown up, mm -hmm. is that when you kind of started getting involved in getting recognition for the Rosie the Riveters? Oh, no, I started many, many years before that. Okay. I've been it's well over between 40 and 50 years probably now that I've... I, I didn't go after it really hard. I started out writing to anybody or everybody that would listen to me, mm -hmm. like TV stations, newspapers. I wanted to promote. They, they totally neglected and ignored what the women did when the war was over. 
they just dumped us like we were, you know, nothing. The, the men came home to parades and flying flags, and we came home with pink slips. It wasn't fair. I mean, because like the, all the veterans will tell you, had it not been for us women, they couldn't have won the war because they wouldn't have the equipment they needed. And so that was, that was very important. So I just started writing to anybody who would listen to me, and I never gave up. I'd write a little, maybe one decade I'd write more than another. And I guess it was in the beginning maybe of 2000 when a newspaper picked up on one of my articles, and it just snowballed after that. And I asked her, I said, why, after all this time that I've been writing and trying to get um, recognition for the women, that uh, all of a sudden you picked up on it. And she says, so much, so many articles, so much goes across our desk every day, and your letter came across the day that we needed a story like that. So timing is so important. Right. So that's why I say don't give up, because you just never know. So you said this was right around 2000, correct? Right. Uh -huh. And how many years up to that point in time had you been writing? You know? Oh, right like I said, I'm back in the... I guess the early 70s and the 70s and before. Okay, so it was 30 years. Uh -huh. Oh, and, more than that, even more than that. Until things just, finally took off. I just never I just never gave up. and Because uh, I just think it wasn't fair. And I said, what the women have achieved. I have so many women come to me and say, I had it not been for you women, I wouldn't be a doctor today. I wouldn't be a general today. And I said, we opened the doors. You're the ones who are doing it, and we're just so proud of you. And so this was in 2000, and so you said it kind of started to snowball then. What were kind of the next steps? What happened? Well, it started out when the, when the newspaper article came out. That's when Twilight Wish Foundation read about it, and they uh, called me, Michelle called the newspaper and said for her duty to our country, we'd like to send her to uh, California to her convention. Which they did, and they paid. Uh, I was one of the Twilight Wishes Foundation's uh, wishes. And, and what was the convention? It was a Richmond convention. It was a National Rose River Day in Richmond, California. And that was great. That was a stepping stone, too. And I just get so many invites. After you went to this convention, um, and, and as you said, things continued to kind of mm -hmm. snowball from, from, from there, um, what, what are some of the next things that kind of happened on this, on this path? I was able to, speaking at a golf course one day, I'd just say a few words, Drew Kest, and, and I met the Mike Fitzpatrick general, you know, his uh, chief of staff, uh, Stacey Mulholland, and she wanted to know my story. Well, Mike took my story to Washington right away. I watched him, he's on the floor, and he says, saying, May Cryer this and May Cryer that. May Cryer, who is approaching her 90s, still beams with pride when she recalls her days as a riveter on Boeing's B-17 warplane assembly line. American women like May gain notoriety as Rosie the Riveters, and they remain a symbol of strength and confidence for our nation. I'm okay. just stunned because, you know, I had been worked so hard for this kind of uh, acknowledgement, and when it starts to happen, it's amazing. And, you know, that lead, one thing just leads to another. And I get now, I get more requests than I can handle. See, you had mentioned that th this is picking up steam. Part of the reason was you said they got sick of hearing from you. <laughs> that... I told that to Senator Casey uh, when we got on the first National Rosie Ribder Day. I said, I know why you gave us this day. You're just sick and tired of hearing from me. <laughs> okay, okay. And, and so now there is a National Rosie the Riveter Day because of all the work that you've that done. That was the first one, yeah. That yeah. was the first we got. It's an annual, correct? Uh, yeah. Uh, Senator Casey, uh, this man that worked for him, he told me one year, he said to me, they're talking about the Congressional Gold Medal. Well, I know nothing about that at all. And he said, they're talking about it. They're talking about, you know, um, applying for it or whatever they mm -hmm. do for these women. He said, but keep it under your hat because it's nothing, uh, uh, it's set in stone there anymore yet. So, of course, we worked to try to get that to go through, but it didn't go through that year. But then uh, we worked hard and finally got it, and I'm just so thrilled over it. And we're going to come back to this, but there is a National Rosie the Riveter Day. What day is it? Um, my birthday, March 21st. It's your birthday. <laughs> okay. There's uh, a medal being minted, and and that is that is the Congressional Gold Medal for the Rosie the Riveters, correct? Right. Mm -hmm. When does this happen? Well, it takes a long. I don't know. We've been, been on. See, the artists have to, every detail, we have to approve or disapprove of every little detail the coin, so it takes a long time. 
uh, to firm to decide on the medal. Now we have all agreed what we want on the medal. So now it's a matter of being processed, but they're say, they tell me there's so many ahead of us. I guess this isn't anything they can do overnight. With, with all the, the, the Rosie the Riveter activities during COVID, you started getting involved in making the bandanas and the little face masks, correct? Mm -hmm. And how did that all come about? Well, I've always sewed. I've always been a sewer. I've been a crafter, so I sew a lot. So when the pandemic started, I started making masks. I'd make them for neighbors, and I'd put them out on the I have a net I'd put out there where they'd just come and take masks. And I start, most of all, I did the polka dot. And then I just started sending them to the people who'd helped us get our National Rosy River Day and things like that. And just as a thank you, and uh, after about 300, it went viral, and it just really spun out of control. She's making masks for the masses for about eight hours each day. The red polka dot pattern woven deep in Cryer's fabric, once herself a Rosie the Riveter. We ended up just um, saying we'd made 5,000, but the way it ended up, I made 6,000. I had a little help with the sewing, but very little, but we had help with the mailing, even Boeing packaged and mailed like 1,500 or something like that for it. So we had a lot of people helping us in different ways, but I started doing this all free of charge. But after it went so viral and went out of control, I couldn't afford to do it. So they started sending me the material, elastic, the, everything I needed, even the postage. And the nicest thing of the whole thing that came out of this is when they'd received these masks, I'd get the most beautiful letters. I said that I've got boxes of letters where they told me stories of their fathers, their mothers, their, oh, just the most beautiful stories. I said some make you laugh, some would make you cry, but I read every one of them. One special one was a lady was in the, the towers when the plane hit, and she said she knew she wasn't going to get out alive. She said she looked up and she seen her poster, Rosie River, and said, we can do it. And she, that was one of them I, that she wrote. But stories like that, they're wonderful, you know. This is our American people. It met with a lot of success and a lot of appreciation, mm -hmm. but but so much that there is a a bandana and a mask that had a mission. They just couldn't believe when Boeing that they wanted to put it on the International Space Station. I couldn't believe that. I said, Rosie is really getting her day there, right. you know, and that's such a nice honor for mm -hmm. uh, that mask represents Rosie, that mask right. and bandana. And uh, I just think that's such a, a nice thing, but I didn't know. I often wonder what they're going to do with them when they come back. And they never told me, but the women from Boeing, they knew what was, I guess, was taking place. And when they framed them, the lady from Boeing took me down to Washington. It was during cherry blossom time, and I'd never seen the cherry blossoms in bloom. It was beautiful. And here they gave them back to me, the coin that had also gone into space. Right. So, And it's, it's all framed as right. of right now, yeah. And now they're talking about the Smithsonian or one of the okay. museums there, Aeronautical okay. Museum or someplace in Washington. So, and these are all, because of the efforts that you, you've made, right. all these things are now starting to happen or have ha happened. Right. And now with my bandanas, now it goes back to bandanas, which we always wore. We had to wear bandanas. I've been made like a hundred and some for the group down in Tampa, Florida. They're going to uh, put them with the American flag and fly them over Normandy. And uh, this is, they do that, they raise money like that. So I still make a lot of bandanas and things for uh, different organizations or just unlike when I went to Texas, uh, yeah, that school when I went to, they invited yeah. me to that school. And what, what school was that? That's Yobaldi. That was where the 19 students and two teachers were killed. And they invited me to come. Just, uh, first of all, they weren't sure whether I was going to speak to the students or what. And I said, I don't know if I could do that. That's so emotional. Well, they just took me under their wing, and they just took me everywhere. I, it was hard to tell whether they're healing me or I was healing them. It was uh, so emotional. And they were, before I left, they gave me the key to the city, and they invited me back. They just put a nice story on the Facebook about my visit down there. You had said that they asked you if you wanted to go skydiving. <laughs> That's what that group from Dayton, Ohio wanted oh. me to go, they wanted me really serious about me skydiving with them. Mm -hmm. I said, are you crazy? <laughs> and so this girl from Texas, she says, I know you won't skydive when you drive a tank. 
I said, sure. I didn't realize how hard it was to get in and out of that tank. What kind of tank was it? A Sherman. <laughs> okay. okay. So you got in and you drove, you drove a Sherman well, you tank. Know, driving it isn't hard. I mean, it's simple because I thought they'd have a dual controlled or something. They didn't. I was, I was it, period. But uh, it was simple once you'd learn how you just got two levers in the gas. But uh, uh, just getting them to, everything to work together, you're scared to start with. So not many people drive a tank, and I'm no, sure not no. many people do it at 97. <laughs> yeah. They were kidding me. The girls were three or three, four women up on top, and they said I went too close to the side of the road, and I ran over a tree. I knocked them. I was talking about. <laughs> Thank you for for all of this. Is is there anything else that you can you can think of that we haven't covered that you'd like to that you'd like to say? Well, only that I just I'm just going to continue to make the women realize their potential, mm -hmm. and for them to teach the young girls. I mean, this young girls. Our society coming up, they're so smart. I mean, and women are just as capable as men in most. They don't have the strength of a man, but basically they're every bit as good. And now that they're opening doors for women, we have a lot of women that are, are presidents, vice presidents of corporations, things like that, which is nice. It's hard for the men to accept that. That's the bad part. I said, I don't treat, teach to women to be superior. I want us to be equal. I want us to be equal partners. So, so it's you're you're doing some wonderful things, and it sounds like you're going to continue. Well, I hope yeah, so. Yeah, I have so many people who come to me. Things are fun. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I I appreciate this. You've done some great things. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you're going to continue to do so, and, and you've got a cause. <laughs> I, I do have. I do yeah. have. I just want all of our rosies to be recognized before they're all gone. There's not a lot of us left anymore.